This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 8, for broadcast on the 17th of January, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, how the mysterious centaurs of the outer solar system gain their comet-like characteristics. The serendipity of discovering a fast radio burst in just four days. And the discovery of the most distant and powerful fast radio burst ever detected. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has concluded that close encounters with the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn are causing a group of frozen outer solar system asteroid-like worlds to evolve comet-like features. The findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal suggest that the orbits of these mysterious worlds known as the centaurs are being rapidly reshaped by the powerful gravitational perturbations being exerted by the solar system's two most massive planets. The study's authors say this in turn leads to centaurs exhibiting comet-like activity. Centaurs are tiny worlds similar to asteroids in size, but more like comets in their composition. They circle the Sun and the outer solar system between the orbits of Jupiter and Neptune. The findings suggest that around 10% of centaurs eventually go on to become comets. The study's lead author, Eva Lilly from the Planetary Science Institute, says the new work goes some way towards answering a long-standing mystery about why some centaurs become active like comets, while others appear just like regular quiet asteroids. They looked at the dynamical history of all known centaurs, both active and inactive, and then coupled those findings with thermal modelling. They were looking for some kind of pattern common in active centaurs that inactive centaurs lack. But mapping the dynamical history of the centaurs is really tricky because they're orbiting out in the realm of the gas and ice giants, and so their orbital evolution is governed by the chaotic influence of the giant's gravitational pull. To resolve the problem, Lily and colleagues used a numerical integrator, that is a code that predicts how the orbit of a celestial body evolves. But for centaurs, this can only be known for a short period of time, typically just a few hundred years. After that point, the chaos starts to make the prediction inaccurate. They discovered that all active centaurs had undergone a close encounter with either Jupiter or Saturn, and that this encounter caused a large orbital change known as an A-jump. The A-jump usually caused a decrease in the semi-major axis of the centaur's orbit, while at the same time reshaping it from elliptical to more circular and lower perihelion orbits. And the change was really rapid, on the order of just a few months, with the semi-major axis being decreased by several astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, around 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. The A-jump then effectively places the affected centaurs into new orbits, orbits where their surfaces have more time to warm up, allowing more heat to soak into the crust and mantle, where it can then reach interior ices, which can then sublimate, effectively turning the centaur active. The thing is, centaurs are icy by nature. They're thought to have all originated in the Kuiper Belt, a ring of comets, icy worlds and frozen debris, which circles the Sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Gravitational perturbations with other objects in the outer solar system can then fling these objects in towards the realm of the giants, where they become centaurs. An A-jump then simply moves them closer towards the sun, where it's warm enough for the ice inside these things to undergo a phase transition such as sublimation, turning the centaur into a comet. This is Space Time. Still to come, discovering a fast radio burst in just four days and the most distant and powerful fast radio burst ever detected. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Back in 2017, a CSIRO telescope found its first fast radio burst from space after searching for less than four days. 
The amazing discovery, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, came so quickly that the telescope, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, which is located in the Murchison of outback Western Australia, quickly gained a reputation as a rising star in this fiercely competitive area of astronomy. Fast radio bursts are an enigma. They're sudden, empirical blasts of radio energy, lasting just a nanosecond or so, but releasing more power in that time than our sun does in an entire year. The bursts occur at very specific wavelengths, usually at cosmic distances and usually in the spiral arms of galaxies billions of light years away. The first was discovered back in 2007 in data from the Parkes Radio Telescope in far western New South Wales. Since then, hundreds more have been detected. These short ultra-bright flashes of radio energy can happen in any part of the sky and they're thought to be occurring hundreds of times a day. Some flashes last just milliseconds, others can last more than a second or more and they can span a wide range of radio luminosities. The first fast radio bursts detected were all singular events occurring just once at a specific location and then never again. That suggests they were caused by some sort of cataclysmic event such as a supernova explosion. Trouble is, astronomers are now detecting many fast radio bursts that are actually repeaters coming from the same location at different times, and that suggests a different origin. Right now, the leading contender is a highly magnetized type of neutron star called a magnetar. But feeding black holes and glitching neutron stars haven't been ruled out just yet. Now, if correct, it means there could be two completely separate causes for these mysterious deep space blasts. Or it could be that in fact all fast radio bursts are repeaters, with some just a lot more active than others. The discovery of the 2017 ASCAP burst, catalogued as FRB 170107, was made by Dr Keith Bannister and colleagues from the CSIRO, Curtin University, and the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, while they were using just eight of the ASCAP telescope's 36 12-metre parabolic dishes. The find was the culmination of a decade of science and engineering development by the CSIRO and Curtin University. To make the historic detection, the authors used an unusual strategy. Bannister says they turned the telescope into a sort of Sauron of space, referring to the dark overlord of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Usually, ASCAP's dishes all point to one part of the sky at a time but they can also be made to point in slightly different directions, sort of like segments in a compound eye. And this multiplies the amount of sky the telescope can see. It allowed the eight ASCAP dishes being used to see 240 square degrees at once. That's about a thousand times the area of the sky normally covered by the full moon. The fast radio burst was found as part of a research project called CRAFT, the Commensural Real-Time ASCAP Fast Transient Survey. FRB 170107 came from the edge of the constellation Leo, and it appears to have been travelling through space for around 6 billion years before reaching the observatory. Bannister says the burst was extremely bright, and its apparent distance meant the energy involved must have been enormous. We've been working on on this uh, fast radio burst search mode with the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder for a while. And so um, we've had a few telescopes to play with and we've been getting all our software and everything in place. And then during that January period, there was a shutdown, so no one was on site. So I thought I'd asked around and thought, oh, no one's using the antennas for a while. We'll t- check out to see if this mode works or not. And then uh, it sure did because we looked through the data and bam, there was an FRB right there. We had some hints that there might be some really bright FRBs out there. And if we could cover enough of the sky in a single go, that we'd be able to find them pretty quickly. And it turns out that you know, it's pretty close to being right. Determining their origin is because they're so far away is still the issue, isn't it? It's a huge topic of inquiry in astronomy at the moment. And as you say, if you just collect one, sadly it doesn't tell you where it came from as much detail as you'd like. The one you guys found, that was what, six billion light years away? That's almost halfway across the universe. It is indeed, yeah. So, um, you know, if it's that far across the universe, then it has to be prodigiously bright for us to be able to see it. So, you know, that sort of object, we just, we really have no good understanding for what type of object can be that bright. This is all very reminiscent of the search a couple of decades ago for mysterious explosions as powerful, almost as powerful as the Big Bang itself. In fact, that was often the headline that press reports would have, the most powerful explosion since the Big Bang. I am, of course, referring to gamma ray bursts. We now know what they are. 
took a long time and they were really hard to track down because they were so ephemeral. This is so reminiscent of that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. The key thing with the gamma ray bursts, if you talk to that community, the key thing was when someone managed to localize one, so really get a great, a good, you know, a pinpoint accuracy position for uh, the gamma ray burst when it happens and everyone found that out and what that position was and trained their telescopes there and were able to look at the afterglow and once they had that very quickly the people started to understand what gamma ray bursts are and it turns out they're exploding massive rotating stars. So with fast radio bursts, so more positions or good positions will be the key to, I think to unlocking the secrets of FRBs. So what do you actually see with the radio telescope when you look at a fast radio burst? It's just what a sudden peak in a signal or how does it work? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's a little bit difficult to describe over the phone, so I'm going to wave my arms around and you're not going to see any of it. But That's um, all right. I do radio. So, I can understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's um, what we do is we record uh, the signals from the telescope and we, re we record them at uh, a range of different frequencies. So in the same as radio, uh, you know, imagine with your radio dial, uh, people probably don't have those, have those anymore. But anyway, we record uh, different radio frequencies or radio wavelengths, so the long waves and the short waves, and we get them all at once. And the thing about a fast radio burst is that it's dispersed, which means that the, the short radio waves, waves arrive first and the long radio waves arrive last. So what we're looking for is a signal where you see uh, a little bit of emission starting in the short radio waves, and then it gradually starts to arrive in the long radio waves. And that's the, the signature of the signal we're looking for. And yeah, but basically that blip you know, comes and goes in about a millisecond or much less actually. So you're looking for a real needle in a haystack. And they're all roughly the same in, in terms of the way they look, their characteristics? Uh, they're, well, they're all, uh, they're all dispersed, so they all have that characteristic sweep. But that, the useful thing about FRBs is that that sweep tells you how much matter that the burst has actually gone through between where it came from and our telescope. So while they all have that sweep, the amount of sweep is different for different bursts because different bursts come from come through different amounts of matter. And that's the very exciting thing about them is that every time we see one, it tells us straight away how much, how many electrons or how many atoms it's gone through to get to us. And so with that fact, we can use it to work out the weight of the universe, we hope. Work out what the universe's mass is between us and the FRB. That's right. Yeah, it's a very, very exciting possibility. And it's something that uh, you, know, you can only do with FRBs you can't do with any other technique. Tell me about ASCAP. So ASCAP's a, a fantastic machine built by the CSIRO out in uh, Western Australia. So in the middle of the desert, the Murchison, which is about 600 kilometres west of, of Geraldton. So it's as far away as we can manage from people. And the reason we do that is to get away from the phones they have in their pockets. And ASCAP's a very special machine because it's got 36 dishes. Each one is 12 metres in diameter. So you can imagine a satellite dish, but a big one. And and the special thing about ASCAP is it has a special piece of electronics called a phased array feed. And what's special about that is that it can see 36 different patches of the sky at once. So most radio telescopes can only see one patch of the sky, but the phased array feed can see 36 patches of the sky at once. And that's really handy because if, if you don't know where the FRB is going to come from, it helps to be able to cover a big patch of sky. And so ASCAP is really wonderful because it can really see a huge amount of sky all the time. And you're able to see, what, 240 square degrees all at once using just eight of those antenna dishes. That's right. So yeah, every you know we monitor 240 square degrees, which is about the size of a thousand full moons, and every millisecond we get a new measurement of that piece of sky. So it's a huge amount of data, but you really need it to be able to find FRBs quickly. So that's technology that's designed and built in Australia by the CSIRO. And ASCAP's not the only thing at Murchison. There's another radio telescope array up there as well. That's correct. Yeah, the uh, Murchison Widefield Array or MWA. That's a very different type of machine. It, it works at much lower radio frequencies, and it also they've been looking for fast radio bursts. Yeah, they make wonderful pictures of the sky actually and uh, yeah and it's a very complementary kind of instrument to ASCAP both instruments have a huge field of view which is what makes them so powerful very different looking but with the dipole type antennas on the Murchison Whitefield Array yeah very different but complementary you know they uh, both see a huge amount of sky and that's what makes them so powerful that's Dr. Keith Bannister from the CSIRO and this is Space Time Still to come, more on fast radio bursts with the most distant and most powerful burst ever detected. And later in the science report, a new study claims a plant-based diet could put you at a lower risk of getting COVID-19. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
In the summer of 2022, astronomers detected the most powerful fast radio burst ever observed. And coming from a location that dates halfway back to the Big Bang, it was also the most distant fast radio burst ever spotted. Now, astronomers have finally pinpointed this extraordinary object's birthplace, and it's not what they were expecting. In fact, it's rather curious. Using images from NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, the authors have traced the burst back to not one galaxy, but a whole group of at least seven galaxies. The galaxies appear to be in a cluster in which they're all interacting with each other, perhaps on a path to merging. Such groups of galaxies are rare and possibly could have even led to the conditions that triggered the burst. This unexpected discovery challenges our existing models of how fast radio bursts are produced and what produces them. The study's lead author, Alexa Gordon from Northwestern University, says without Hubble's imaging, it would still have been a mystery as to whether this burst originated from just one monolithic galaxy or from some type of interacting system. She says it's these type of environments, these really weird ones, that drive astronomers towards a better understanding of the mysteries of fast radio bursts. And this record-breaking fast radio burst, which has been catalogued as FRB 2022-0610A, was even more extreme than its predecessors. Not only was it four times more energetic than closer fast radio bursts, it also clocked in as the most distant fast radio burst yet discovered. The burst originated when the universe was just 5 billion years old, compared to its current 13.8 billion year age. In early observations, the burst appeared to have originated near an unidentifiable amorphous blob, which astronomers initially thought was either a single large irregular galaxy or a group of three more distant galaxies. But in a new twist, the sharp Hubble images are suggesting the blob is instead at least possibly as many as seven galaxies, all in incredibly close proximity to each other. In fact, these galaxies are all so close together, they could fit inside the area covered by our own Milky Way galaxy. It's what astronomers refer to as a compact group of galaxies. They're incredibly rare environments in the universe and are considered to be the densest galaxy-scale structures known. They're thought to provide the exact sort of interaction which could trigger massive bursts of star formation. And that might indicate that the progenitor of FRB 2022-0610A is associated with a fairly recent population of stars, which does match what scientists have learned from other fast radio bursts. The thing is, despite hundreds of fast radio bursts having been detected, only a fraction of these have been pinpointed to their host galaxies. And within that small fraction, only a few have come from a dense galactic environment, and none have ever been seen in such a compact group. So, its birthplace is truly rare. Although astronomers have uncovered up to a thousand fast radio bursts since first discovering them in 2007, the sources behind the blinding flashes remain stubbornly uncertain. While astronomers are yet to reach a full consensus on the possible mechanisms behind fast radio bursts, they generally all agree that this must involve a compact object, such as a black hole or neutron star. With a larger sample of distant fast radio bursts, astronomers can begin to study their evolution and host properties by connecting them to more nearby ones, and perhaps even start to identify more strange FRB populations. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study suggests that people who eat plant-based diets could end up with a lower risk of catching COVID-19. A report at the British Medical Journal claims researchers asked 702 participants about their diets and then compared the rates of COVID-19 infection and severity within the group over the period of March to July 2022. The researchers say that even after adjusting for other variabilities such as weight and levels of physical activity, participants who reported following a mainly vegetarian or vegan diet were less likely to have been infected with COVID-19. Now, it's important to point out that this kind of study can't prove that the diet caused the lower rate of COVID-19 infection. And keeping up your vaccination boosters is also important. 
However, the authors say it's possible a higher intake of nutrients in vegetables could impact the way one's immune system responds to COVID-19. Archaeologists have undertaken detailed examinations of ancient grinding tools in order to better understand one of the earliest chapters in human history. The findings reported in the journal PLOS One show that these early people were using grinding tools for the preparation of food, such as grinding grains for baking bread and crushing bone to access marrow, as well as general plant and pigment processing during what was known as Green Arabia between six and 8,000 years ago. The work is based on U-square analysis of five grinding tools that archaeologists excavated from the Jibril Oraf dig site in the Jebel Oasis in the Nufed Desert of northern Saudi Arabia. The researchers say the find offers fresh insights into a little understood chapter of human history. A new study has found that Tasmanian quolls are changing genetically in response to the decline of Tasmanian devil populations. A report in the journal Nature, Ecology and Evolution suggested as some Tasmanian devil populations declined due to the spread of facial tumour disease, spotted tail quolls in those areas are being influenced genetically by their absence. Spotted tail quolls are a less dominant predator in Tasmania and their behaviour has changed as devil populations decline. So, researchers collected genomic data from 345 quolls over the course of 15 generations to see if their genes were changing too. The authors say in areas where facial tumour disease was impacting Tasmanian devil populations, there was evidence of less movement of genes between quoll populations, increased population structure, and changes in genes specifically related to muscle development, movement and feeding behaviour. The authors say it's likely these traits are related to competition between devils and quolls, and the absence of competition could be changing the way the quolls are evolving. The world's biggest consumer electronics show, CES, is back bigger and better than ever this year. More than 140,000 people attended the 2024 Expo in Las Vegas. This year's highlights have included the KeplerBot, a human-like robot which will go on sale in the US for just 50,000 US dollars. Then there's the fridge, which knows exactly what you've taken out of it, so it can tell you what to reorder next time you go to the store. There was Oro, a robotic companion for your pet that'll even play fetch with a dog. And there's the EPRAM, which will rock your baby to sleep when you don't want to. With the details of this year's vast array of gadgets, we're joined by technology editor Alex saharov Royt from techadvice.life. It's been back to pre-COVID levels of attendance, 140,000 people, the traffic jams are chaotic, and uh, there's been some interesting tech. Samsung has launched its AI for All initiative. Its screens are going to be AI screens. So in the short term, this means that if you have content that is a 4 by 3 standard definition TV show where you have content that is even uh, 720p or 1080p, when this gets upscaled to 8K, uh, Samsung has some incredible AI technology that restores the sharpness. And they had actually their TV next to somebody else's from 2023. And you could really see the difference. Now, they also have a uh, redesigned home screen that will link up to all their smart things, home automation. Uh, You can actually play console games on your TV. You just need to have a Bluetooth controller. There's also the ability to have accessibility features such as subtitles. Now, a lot of shows have subtitles, but for the shows that don't have subtitles, this can automatically generate them. You can also emulate your remote control on your mobile phones, much larger screen. Often those little buttons on a remote control are quite small. And then Samsung also has something called Bali, B-A-L-L-I-E. You might remember we spoke about Amazon Astro. This is a couple of years ago. They had this little robot that can run around the house, got a big screen like an Alexa tending screen, yeah. little camera that can pop up and see if you turn the oven off or it can bring drinks around the house. Look, I don't know whatever happened to that. Certainly it's not on sale here in Australia. And LG actually also announced a similar looking robot with a screen, can run around. I mean, these things have generative AI, Oro. so you can talk to this, them. This is Oro. The LG one, yeah. yeah. The one from Samsung is quite different. So it looks like the lower half of the BB-8 robot from Star Wars. So the one that wasn't R2-D2, the one that ran around on a ball. Now, the one in Star Wars had two balls, one at the top and a bigger one at the bottom. This ball, he only has one ball at the bottom. It's got a couple of wheels, and it can roam around and answer questions and, and do things. But it, instead of having a screen, it has a projector. So it can project a zoom call onto a wall. It can project the night sky when you're in bed wanting to have a look to see what the stars are doing, or you want some sort of soothing animation to fall asleep. It can project onto the wall your fitness routine that you can then 
go along with it. You can even project things onto the floor to entertain the dog. And of course, it has a camera. It can roam around. It's the beginning of those companion robots. This looks like it's going to be something a lot more useful. And look, we'll see that robots were a feature. Samsung also had a transparent OLED screen. Now, this is something they've been working on for a while. They also, on their display, showcased a transparent LCD and a transparent LED, but those had bezels. This one had no bezels. One example I gave was you're in a corporate box looking at a football match, a baseball match, whatever it might be, and you're looking at the field, but there's a piece of glass in between you and the field, and that glass can display information as though you were wearing an augmented reality headset, the stats of the players, the scores, that sort of thing. And look, LG actually has their signature OLED T screen ready to go. They're going to bring it to market this year. They had a big giant wall of 15 of these displays and they actually have this contrast screen that can roll up and roll down. When it's rolled down, you can see right through the display and when you're playing video, it's actually pretty good. Uh, You you know, you'd have to have something really close up to be able to to see something was there. But when it's off, you can have artwork on the wall, you can have it out looking over an open window, you can, I mean, you just don't have this big black mirror when it's off. These sorts of screens, you'll see them in cars on heads-up displays, you'll see them in various technologies where you need to be able to look through something but also have information appear the very first thing that i saw actually was a thing called dot lumen and these are glasses for blind people that help them to see now you wear this band around your head it's about 1.5 kilos and it's going to be lighter by the time they go to production and it's got sensors cameras and lidar you put it on and then it's able to see what's in front of you and relay that information to you using haptics i felt when i put it on i felt this little vibration across my forehead to tell me that there was something in my path and was trying to guide me to go left or to go right and so that is something that will be launched later this year i was impressed with that and then there was a thing called moonwalkers this is a pair of shoes you put on that has six wheels on it. And so you might think, well, hang on, we've got uh, roller skates, we've got uh, roller blades, we've got skateboards. You know, what, what's the big deal about putting wheels on your shoes? Well, those things are unwieldy. You can't really use them to just walk around. Normally, you have, sort of have to be skating along. And this particular moonwalkers allowed you to go up to about seven miles per hour. That's about 11 kilometers. You can sort of go faster, go slower. You can use it to walk to the shops in a quicker way. You can use it to go over bumpy terrain. You can use it inside of a big warehouse. Uh, you can use it in different places. And it just, it's the first time that we've had this mobility that's so personalized. You can pop them on, pop them off, charge them by USB. Unfortunately, they're 1400 dollars oh. <laughs> the first version is not cheap even the new augmented reality glasses by apple are over three grand well they're three and a half thousand us and in fact tim cook did a bit of very clever ambush marketing two days before ces began properly he put out a tweet saying apple vision pro coming to stores february the 2nd in I the us that. so I three and a half that. grand yeah and uh, a lot of people were talking about that. I mean, Sony had a headset designed for the industrial metaverse where you, know, that you put these headsets on and you can wander around warehouses or you can do maintenance on cars. or you know, it's for, for those sort of warehouses and enterprise and field work uh, where you have this headset on and you can have access to training manuals or repair guides. I mean, that sort of thing is already in use out there in the marketplace from a company called TeamViewer, and they use a bunch of different headsets. This is going to be the decade of these headsets. Now, look, DHL was sponsoring Jetpack Racing, which was pretty cool. Uh, Sony had their electric car on stage that they drove out using a Bluetooth PlayStation controller. And LG at this stand also had uh, an electric car. And they said, look, this is an actual, this is sort of a concept. We're not announcing the car. We're not going into the car business. But they were showing these giant screens in the car. I mean, that would be an awesome looking car. It looks even more futuristic and advanced than your Teslas and BYDs and other sort of cars. But because it's a concept car, they just have to build one. But I'd buy one just by looking at it. It looked really cool. So look, lots of things. AI, I mean, Intel announced that it's finally got the Intel Core Ultra. They're cheap with AI built in, but that's a year after AMD released the same thing. And AMD also at this event launched their 8000G, a desktop processor with AI built in. And of course, with Elon Musk, he's received his 13th money transmitting license in the US. So it's not a bank yet, but he can send money like Venmo or Cash App. And it's sort of one step closer for him to have something like XPay. Uh, he started from, PayPal, from didn't he? Wasn't Elon Musk the... He did. Yeah, yeah. He did. Yeah, he did. And, and you know, PayPal has fewer users than X, but because they have a banking license, they make a lot more money. So, I mean, Twitter could be, or X could be quite profitable if Musk could turn it back into an app for payments. And he's already said he wants to have the the everything app like WeChat in China, where you can do lots of different things. And he wants to bring video calls to the bases aspect of X. So instead of just group audio chats, you can have group video chats and wants to augment the Twitch video game streaming service clone that is within X already. So he's got lots of different ideas. And uh, that's all happened during the week of CES. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from Tech Advice. Start live.
that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 